the innovation space. I actually started my career a long time ago as an actuary, but I wasn't the, the best actuary. I quickly found it a little bit soulless, just uh, playing with numbers all day. But I was really good at the innovation stuff. So I started my career at Discovery, and there all the actuaries, three, 400 of them, used to go and have a competition every year present to Adrian Gore and what's the best idea that can change discovery. And I entered twice, I won it twice. So I was always very good uh, and probably a bit ahead of the game in that. Um, but later on in my career, you know, I moved to a couple of companies and I think things changed for me when in 2015, um, the CEO of Alexander Forbes, Edward Kieswetter, um, decided to create a skunk work outside of the Alexander Forbes group and asked me to head it up. And at that stage, I thought I knew what I was doing. I thought I knew about innovation, about how the world's changing, but I soon realized I knew absolutely nothing. You know, you start being uh, challenged and asked to create a company from scratch or new products from scratch from a blank piece of paper, and you start investigating the world, where things at. And for the first time ever, had time without any operational duties. And I just realized that even though I felt uh, and I was ahead of the other guys, I was just so far behind where I could have been. And uh, for two years, till the middle of 2017, I just learned so much, dedicated myself to self-learning and built new, built a new division for the Alexander Forbes Group, built a whole bunch of new solutions that I really catapulted myself into space where I could comfortably say that there are not many people could, that could match my level of expertise in the whole new world, everything got to do fourth industrial revolution, innovation, growing a company and, and everything in that sphere. And I think it definitely opened my eyes to the importance of uh, continuous lifelong learning, which is so easy to stop at this stage. And I feel that my success has all been down to my dedication over recent years to continually learn and learn and learn some more and wrote a book called Exponential Potential that a uh, year or so back uh, was out in all the bookstores. And yeah, just go, got great feedback on that. And, and after that, just been helping so many of South Africa's biggest companies understand this new world of, of digital and all the enabling technologies and just different ways of thinking, just to make sure they stay relevant and don't get disrupted. And yeah, it was just uh, being quite a ride and enjoying it a hell of a lot. One of the reasons I almost say is I wrote it by mistake. So I never intentionally set out to write a book. So what I did is I just realized that I've gained so much knowledge that I wanted to share with others and more widely. And I didn't know where, what, or how. So I started to, but you can't go to companies and you can't go to CEO of a company and say like, I know so much that you guys don't know. And I know a lot of stuff about things, you know, it becomes too airy, very unclear. You'll, no one will ever hire you to do anything. So I started putting a bit of a framework together for myself, putting some notes, a lot of my learnings, everything came down. And then at a stage I thought, okay, this is quite a good framework. Maybe doing master classes with companies, um, taking quite an odd shape. But then it started just adding more and more and more. And I started thinking to myself, wow, this is actually a really, would make a really awesome book. And then I just started chatting to some guys. I just chatted to some of the execs at Exclusive Book. And I just said, listen, I want to send you a manuscript. Just tell me what you think about it. And uh, they came back and not only did they say, yo, we really want to stock your book. Uh, we actually want to take you on to give us insights into our own company. So that was amazing validation that I actually created something that was quite worthwhile and then just uh, ramped up and scaled it for, from there. And the main premise behind my book is very much how to grow a company. Uh, it is slightly to a lot of the stuff that I focus on when I help companies on, on a daily basis. It's more, it's very much also in the entrepreneurial lines around how do you go about growing, creating and growing a company, everything from stretch, everything from the mindset you have to have to how to come up with ideas, to how to grow something and put together a agile business plan once you've done that, 
to all what's the latest digital tools and enabling technologies to market and growth hack your company, to how do you spawn competition all legally and ethically using online technology, how to network, how to learn, how to do, do everything that comes with that. And for large organizations also, how do you create that type of entrepreneurial culture that that inside your organization that will help you grow like the startups that are growing exponentially quickly. So yeah, it's very much a playbook for someone who's looking to grow their company, be it the smaller one or even a larger organization. We live in a very dichotomous world, so it's very strange. And on one side, there's never been more of a risk to individuals of being uh, coming obsolete and irrelevant and to really, really struggle financially because of all the technologies that can either replace their jobs or make their previous small business unnecessary now because technology can do it and replace it. But on the other side, more importantly, is that for the few individuals who actually decide to dedicate themselves to understanding how technology and everything that comes along with it uh, can help them do every single element of their work. If you know that the potential of what you can achieve is quite endless and exponential, you can really achieve so much if you just know how to tap into and, and leverage the, if all the enabling platforms that come your way and all the enabling techniques and, and the right framework of mind, companies can grow faster than ever before. So a good example is uh, the, the electric scooter companies that have become very popular in America. They've absolutely shattered the records for fastest companies to ever reach billion dollar valuations. They did it in well under a year. And it just showed because that would never ever before have been possible. Like the the usual benchmark of companies that grew really quickly was like a Facebook. And they took five years to be worth a billion dollars. These companies took well less than a year to be worth closer to $2 billion. And it's just today we're living in a different time from what we even lived three, four years ago. You know, like three, four years ago, you wouldn't have been able to achieve what you could today. But you have to know how and that's what i just try to in a small way and hopefully in a practical way get across in the book a lot of the stuff that i didn't go onto in the book because the problem is that the stuff changes so quickly is really the the using artificial intelligence and the using you know all the augmented and blockchains and all those type of realities because the fact is that it would become really outdated very fast this stuff is just growing too quickly a lot but the thing is that uh, there's still a lot of gems and a lot of resources and practical resources that can really help you not only grow faster, but save a huge amount of money when you're looking to do what you're looking to do. The biggest lessons were really in the comparisons between being inside the organization and being outside. Being outside and having a small team and a blank piece of paper and working, you can achieve so much more. I remember we were called in by the CEO to to come and speak to the executives, and he says you must be harsh and you must t- and you must say to them this is how we managed to uh, just a couple guys achieve more than the whole <laughs> the rest of the whole organization in the last six months just being three people versus three thousand. And listen, I didn't make a lot of friends doing that so with the rest of the executives, but they were just shocked at how much could be achieved when you have free reign to do stuff and you're not being held back by all the systems and all the governance and and all the usual blockers. And when you have a bit of a red carpet instead of having all the red tape just to do what you need to do. And uh, I was very much inside organization. Like I was a handful for anyone inside organization because I didn't fit into any box and challenged every way any, <laughs> any process was done and done. and. That in a company, you know, your usual entrepreneurial spirit is often uh, crushed and often you have to go along with the status quo in order to get by, not ruin relationships and uh, actually not make yourself too vulnerable. A lot of the companies that aren't acting at the right speed are really killing the spirit of their staff. So a lot of people will come but they'll only do it once. They'll invest lots of energy because they've got this idea that they can benefit the organization and they put a lot of effort to it, only to be blocked at every turn. And do you know what? They'll never do it again because they just think, do you know what? It's not worth that effort. 
or they'll think it's not worth that effort doing it here. Let me go and do that on my own or approach a competitor to do it with them. And that's the thing inside the large organization, that spirit is completely killed. So the nice thing about being in the skunk work was that you had some funding, but you didn't have any of those usual blockages in there. And there's so many inside corporates, there's so many layers upon layers uh, upon un- layers that are so unnecessary. And uh, often that rather do things operationally soundly even if it's not the right things. So there are too many people that their job incentivizes to know. So for example, your head of compliance or your head of legal, they incentivize to say no to you because they don't lose out by, uh, by saying to you, you can't do something. You know, things just go along as they are, but they could massively lose out if you do something that causes a problem. And executives themselves aren't incentivized either because most of them is very short-term incentives and they think to themselves, okay, they've got a very big salary, can get very big bonuses as long as nothing drastically fails and the ship that drastically doesn't sink. So there isn't that long-term view in terms of we need to create this company that creates this legacy. And most companies just don't have that. There isn't a knowledge often from the leadership of what is the latest things happening in the world? What can be done today? How much should something cost? What can't be done today? How can you do things, for example, using artificial intelligence that you've never done before? And it's very hard to make decisions that way because, you know, you're never quite sure. Someone comes to you and says, oh, you should use our product, our platform to, to help your business succeed. And you never know, okay, well, yes, this is the most amazing thing. It will work or not. No, this isn't the most amazing thing. And it's very hard to make decisions. And it's very hard for people inside of the organization to come up with amazing things if they're not constantly exposed to amazing new happenings in every different industry. So um, once you, our brains naturally land up connecting things. So uh, Steve Jobs said that um, creativity is just around uh, about connecting things. And it's a really true view. If you expose yourself to enough amazing new companies that are innovating and seeing what they're doing from across the globe in different industries, you you will be the best innovator ever because your mind will naturally uh, address problems by using information that you've already seen to say, well, we've got something now. Do you know something else has worked really, really well in a different industry, in a different place? Let's apply that to to what we want to do or these are the core building blocks of what you can do with a blockchain or a AR or a virtual reality and applying those to the challenges that you face and to innovating. But most people, they, they don't know what can be done. What can be done is more important than how to do it. You always find someone who can help you implement what you, you ideate, but they don't know what can be done. And there's a huge problem with that because if you've got a whole bunch of people who aren't exposed to what's possible today, you're going to have a whole lot of people who just aren't bringing forth better solutions to serve your clients. The biggest hindrances I feel is that right at the top, most companies now have board of directors who are very experienced and have done great things in the old world of work. They've done really great things in a total different era. So you have a lot of guys in their 60s that were directors at companies and CEOs and valuable positions, and they they dictating certain targets for the company and expectations from the CEO and the executives right from the top. And I feel that it's actually terrible because in a rare exception, there'll be someone who really understands where the world is heading, how things need to be done in the new world, how things need to be conducted with recent innovation. And they are just very much excited on short-term results. So they're very much excited about, okay, what are the next terms results that we need to show to shareholders? And when that happens, it causes a terrible cycle because when that happens, all that happens is that the CEO and the other executives want to make sure that the next quarterly or half yearly or annual results are as good as possible. So often what they do, especially when a company hasn't traditionally done well, they'll try to reduce expenditure everywhere they can 
and they'll only focus on key short-term tasks. And that way, they're not as worried about growing this company to future-proof itself and to disrupt the market or everything. They're, everything is around making that next financial statement into the ultimate goal. And when that happens is it, every, the rest of the organization responds in turn. And I feel that that short-sightedness and that myopic view of it is just very, very damaging through the whole culture because that innovation culture needs to be driven from the top. There isn't a CEO and a bunch of executives in the country who doesn't say innovation is important to them and doesn't preach that to their people. The only thing is that employees don't take them seriously, but there will still be that pressure on we have to create that next level solution that could disrupt the disrupt the market. And and when that happens, the whole organization responds in turn because that's the way that the executives treat it. And uh, the problem is that it's just too easy to log with the organization and, and be mediocre and not do much without any repercussions. It's just too easy to just go along and not change anything uh, along, along the way. And it's just very hard then to be inside that organization. And then as soon as you get into a cycle of not innovating, it becomes a vicious cycle because what happens is you only creating as an organization one new thing a year, maybe if you're lucky, two new things, potential products or ways of working or new services in a year, there's that obsession with making sure that that one or two things that you do are 100% likely to be a success. And what happens then is that it becomes over-analyzed and over-operationalized and over-tested to make sure, is this thing that we're launching going to be 100% a success? But the thing is, when you have the opposite cycle where you're doing things all the time, you're innovating all the time, you can do it like Jeff Bezos says. He says that if you're experimenting all the time, you can afford to get most things wrong. Because if you're doing 50 potential new things in a year and 40 fail, but you 10 become great successes, those 10 will give you, easily give you the return on investment from your overall investment and cover the losses that you made. It's just that when you're just doing one thing over here, one thing over there, there's this obsession with making sure this thing better be right and that thing better be right. And then a company takes two years to develop the thing before launching it to market because they're so obsessed with let's make sure this is done perfectly before we get things out. And you have to have that culture of experimentation, that culture of quickly uh, creating things by quickly killing them if they're not right and pivoting until you – you create new solutions and then it becomes an innovative company. It's all around, a lot of it's about around speed, but as soon as that speed stops, you, you really as a company start to sink.